Fantastic. Thank you for that intro, Simon. Um, apologies, everyone. I'm having a bit of a problem with my webcam, otherwise it would normally be on, but uh, at least you can hear me and see the presentation, so I think you'll get most of the gist of it at least. Um, so as Simon said, you know, there, were, there was a time when the sector was quite expensive and it was loved at the time, and now it's very cheap. Uh, by most people's reckoning, and it's unloved. And I suppose the question is, is there an opportunity and will it regain some of its previous luster um, sooner than people anticipate? Uh, today is quite an interesting day to do this presentation. You know, I mean, we've been in a, in a rising uh, Fed fund cycle for a while. Uh, the announcement yesterday by the Fed seems to be, have been taken positively by some investors. I see the UK market is up strongly today. Um, REITs are up 5-6% uh, in the UK market, a lot of the stocks. I see the US REITs are also up 3%, 4%, many of the names today as well. So, you know, as the cycle starts to move to uh, almost at the top to pause, um, you start entering an environment where property might start doing well and start uh, showing its character more and more. Um, having said that, I just want to put on the next slide the sector into historical context. Um, so this is a slide, I call it my, my smarty box, going back to 2001. Property, local property, that's the SAPI and the OPI, is the bright yellow blocks. And uh, it shows asset classes across bonds, equity, uh, balanced portfolio, cash, etc. You can see the way the bright yellow boxes have had great years in 04, 05, 07, 2010, et cetera, um, double digit years, some years doing as much as 50% in 2005. The light yellow box is what developed market property did. That's global property in markets like the USA, the UK, Singapore, Australia, Hong Kong, uh, more for a mature type of market than a developer market. Um, you can see again, those also had some great years in the past. In fact, in 2021, that market was up 41.2%, the best performing of all asset classes. But then you can see how SA property has done in, in recent years as well, particularly 2018, 2019, 2020. Again, that's the depths of COVID coming through very much. You can see the negative performance in many of those years with the dark yellow right at the bottom there. And looking year to date in 2023, and property again in SA, this is updated as of yesterday for those that, that want to know how up to date this is. Um, SA property has had a tough year, uh, down 6%, the OP, down 7%, the SAPI, and developed market property in ZA is, is flat, but in US dollars was down 10% uh, year to date as of a few days ago. Today is probably down about 8% year to date in dollar terms. So, in a rising rate cycle, and given the issues around, you know, guys uncomfortable about uh, distributions in excess of distributable earnings, concerns around loan to values in the sector, um, concerns around interest coverage ratios, um, or exposure to office assets, the sector has gone through, I would say, as much as six years, the SA property sector of, let's use the words, cleaning up its act. Those six years have seen the SA property sector de-gear, um, rebase its earnings, and put themselves in a position that they are now on a sustainable basis going forward. I think that's quite important when you understand the SA property sector to understand where it has been and where it's going to, and how much of it is in the price right now. If you look at the decomposition of total return, those early years, 2000 onwards, where the sector was doing as much as 50% in 2005, was very much driven by capital return more than income return or dividend yield from the sector. What we are anticipating now is a return of the sector in the medium term to more of a 12 to 13% a year return, of which it'll largely be income return with a smaller capital return dynamic. So the sector right now is offering you about a 10% income return with about one to 2% capital return expected by us on a 12 month view. But what's important is the sector starts reasserting itself as a building block in a balanced portfolio and it's a sector that will deliver consistently, consistent being the key word, that 12 to 13 percent return a year that the sector has been known for historically. <coughs> Excuse me. 
this is as of updated as of 1 November 2023, looking at the one year total return from the sector. I mean, again, you can see a wide divergence in returns, as much as 41% from Fortress B on the left there, down to minus 22% from Accelerate Property Fund or 19% negative from MSP, which is MAS, Central and Eastern Europe. So wide divergence in returns across the sector. The three names on the left, Fortress B, Attack, Liberty, Two Degrees, all are having some underpin of corporate action behind it. Fortress B potentially re-reating, um, collapsing uh, the structure into just A units, Attack having done a deal with the government employee pension fund, Liberty Two Degrees, um, an offer being made by, by Standard Bank to take it out. So, I mean, there's various things driving that dynamic on the left-hand side there. But you can see in the middle that red dot, the OP, the J803TR is pretty flat here today, up 1%. Again, on a three-year view, the, the positive for me is the OP, the red line in the middle, is delivering that 19, 20% strong return. But again, let's be clear about this. That's starting from November 2020. So we were coming out of COVID there, and uh, that obviously deflated the base a bit on which this number is being based. But you can see at the left-hand side of the graph, um, the Pula B Community Shopping Center continues to do well, understandably so. Um, you look at Fortress B, again, corporate action, as we said, Bukile, 50% SA, 50% Spanish ex exposure, diversification benefits. <clears throat> there are reasons some of these stocks have done so well. Um, and on the far right, some of the names you see, be it Equitas, um, Fortress A, et cetera, have disappointed um, to some extent what investors were looking for in the last couple of years. If you're looking at retail property as an asset class, just to give you a sense of that, invest uh, tenants are still signing leases at around the six, seven percent escalation level. That's quite important. The far names on the right there, where the numbers are a bit lower, Lighthouse, Sirius, and maybe Rock Castle. Remember that is Central and Eastern Europe, which have different lease dynamics behind it. But the SA assets, um, where there is retail exposure, is signed at about the six, seven percent level. What's also important on the graph on the right is the vacancy rate. We are seeing an operational improvement coming through across the retail sector. Um, there is stabilization happening at the super regional and regional shopping center level, and the community shopping center space continues to perform quite well. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're looking at the, the township or CBD retail, I, again, this is an element which has got larger elements of food anchors in it. Um, they continue to do quite well, out, outstripping the super regional shopping centers. Nothing unexpected there. Um, you're looking at more of a cash-based economy there, and they tend to do quite well. What is quite, quite interesting is if you're looking at the neighborhood shopping centers, you do see very much a dynamic of food doing quite well. Um, compared to the super regionals, again, talking that story of um, more of a large food anchor tenant, which makes the assets more defensive um, with less discretionary spend as a dynamic to come to be worried about. <coughs> this shows a, a perspective on um, retail looking at growth point. It just highlights the fact that if you take growth points, overall retail assets on the left hand side, its valuation is up about 1% on retail since 2021. But the VNA on the right hand side is up about 15% over a comparable time period. Again, this talks the fact that it's a two tiered retail market. There are elements of it that do very well, but if you tend to have a very generic um, regional shopping center to smaller center, shopping center dynamic, um, you tend to do struggle to show valuation uplifts. What is quite important though, is we're not seeing valuations fall. And during COVID and in the years preceding COVID and in the years post COVID, the sector went through the dynamic of ensuring that NAVs have been written down to levels that we believe are sustainable. <coughs> Looking at the, the office space, I think we all know that office for many years went through an oversupply condition. What is pleasing to see is a leveling off on vacancies across national CBD vacancies or decentralized um, or suburban vacancies. You're also seeing a slowdown in supply on the left-hand side of space coming online. What this tells you is office is starting to stabilize at these high vacancy levels. We're still a, while, still a while away from seeing positive rental growth from the asset class. 
but we are starting to see probably two to three years from now office starting to normalize and maybe start showing real rental growth from there. What this slide shows you is that across the A grades of A, B, and C type of offices, vacancies are starting to normalize. As I spoke of the green shoots, the issue is still in office, however, is it's very diverse in terms of asset exposure. You have your very key P grade type of assets, Sassel building, the Discovery building, et cetera. And then you have a fair number of assets that are obsolete in terms of being built in the 1990s, 1980s, and that will struggle to, to find tenants even at a lower rental right now. <clears throat> Looking at the load shedding dynamic here, I mean, you can see on that table at the bottom there, the way load shedding has become increasingly a concern in this economy. Property companies have done a lot of solar, as you can see on the Northgate Mall picture there on the right. They've insulated themselves as much as they can from this dynamic. Some property companies have even has gone as far as to prepare themselves for, let's call it grid failure over time. Um, but that's a very hard thing to do. Um, feasibly in terms of what the cost of doing so would be. But clearly, I mean, as we saw from the medium term budget policy, uh, policy statement as well, load shedding is, a, is an issue in terms of we, we weakening GDP growth for South Africa. I think the other important point to make is while everyone is very key on, everyone is very keen on investing offshore, there is still a lot of companies that are willing to invest in SA in the right type of assets. Equitas is still doing logistics here. Growth Point is still doing assets building here. Fortress as well and storage. But you can see it's very much a niche type of asset classes um, that the demand still exists. I think that one thing a lot of concern has been raised about in recent years has been the dynamic around refinance risk in these property companies. Now, where banks tend to get worried is when the interest coverage ratio gets as low as two, or the loan to values get as high as 50 to 60%. What we're seeing in the sector now is no company is at risk currently of breaching those dynamics. As I said, in the last few years, most of the NAVs have been written down to a point where they are hard um, and unlikely to fall materially from current levels. <clears throat> the finance costs obviously have risen. If you're looking at the graph on the left there, you can see we've seen as much as 70 to 80 basis points rise in average funding costs in 2023. What is important is these property companies have different financing cycles. They are stepped, they are laddered, they are staggered. They're not all maturing in any one given year, which is very important. Redefined has very much gone through its refinancing cycle. Growth Point is now entering that one to more and more of an extent. But looking at the numbers, we aren't concerned that it's gonna rise materially from current levels. The other point to make is property companies do on average fix more than 75% of their debt. So they are not overly concerned about rising interest rates given they have limited variable debt. <clears throat> With the discount to NAV at which property companies have been trading in recent years, it's been very hard to do share issuance. So that source of capital has been eroded. That has meant that they've had to be increasingly strict on capital allocation, um, in, particularly on the loan to value side and focus on de-gearing and cutting the payout ratio on the dividend in order to have some flexibility in terms of retained earnings to fund CapEx projects. As you can see on the left there, the share issuance dynamic has slowed for companies like Growth Point, et cetera. If you, however, are a company like um, Ukile there, you were able to do a share issuance, which was NAV dilutive, but uh, accretive to distributions, given they were able to do an acquisition offshore in Spain. 
This slide is quite important, and it talks to the fact that you can't paint the whole sector with the same brush when you're looking at net asset value and declines in that. If you look at the graph on the left, you'll see equities and investec property fund with the largest negative valuations as of the last results. What you're seeing there is the UK portfolios or European portfolios for those companies devalue. For companies that have a large component of SA exposure, NAVs are not falling five to 6% anymore. That's because they have been written down to the appropriate values and are tending towards minus two to up a couple of percent. We are expecting a strong improvement from Central and Eastern Europe, where companies like Nepi Rock Castle are positioned, given very strong retail recovery seen there, trading density growth, and strong underpinning macroeconomics that are supporting growth in their assets, NOI, net operating income, and likewise in the valuations of their assets. As I said, this companies are now at a payout ratio of around 82.5%. The sector is on a forward dividend yield of near 10%. But distributable earnings, if you take the total amount, the sector is on a distributable income per share yield of 12.2%, which is above the SA bond yield today. If you look on the right-hand side, that 10% uh, yield dividend yield is well above the long-term average of 7.8%. Again, the SA bond deal is obviously elevated as well now, which also reflects in why the sector is on such a high yield. To what Simon said earlier about, you know, the sector LTVs being a concern, and when I think of the NAVs and where they are, given where interest rates have gone, where the Fed has gone, and where the SA bond yield and our repo rate has gone, the sector is trading much more in terms of a dividend yield rather than an NAV, um, again, reflective of the dynamics we find ourselves in. A normalization of dividend yield, of sorry, of uh, the repo rate, the Fed fund rates, uh, the bond yields to what are more historic levels would obviously result in a positive shift in price to books from any of these companies. This is quite a compelling chart. If you look at the price to tangible NAV, price to book effectively, in 08, it got as low as 0.65 in the depths of the global financial crisis. In 2020 April, at the depths of COVID, it fell to as low as 0.5 book value. Today, it's not trading far off those levels, having fallen about 5-6% of the sector, I believe, in the month of uh, October 2023. I think what's important to highlight is where the sector sits today from a strength of balance sheet, repurposed income stream basis, asset valuation level is very different from where it was sitting five, six years ago. We don't believe the sector is going to get back to 1.05 book, which is a long-term average. But we do believe that at these levels, the sector is cheap and does represent value. Again, it's partly a macro call on when the Fed and the SA Reserve Bank start cutting, but there's definitely an element of the sector being oversold. Increasingly in recent months, we are seeing interest arise from general equity investors who are increasingly looking at the sector as an unloved sector that may potentially surprise to the upside at some point in the next 12 to 18 months. This slide looks at the cap rates of the properties. Again, a cap rate is just the income yield or the income you expect from the asset over the asset valuation itself. You can see that retail and office assets have been devalued, as you can see from the rising cap rates, the blue lines, the red dotted lines, et cetera, evident in recent years. We believe in many instances, all of, all of the devaluation that needs to happen is evident already in these cap rates, suggesting they are unlikely to rise materially from here, barring some type of macro event that is unexpected. I put this slide in here to show the correlation or the relationship between the property sector and the SA bond yield and the all share index. I think we all understand property is a quasi bond equity. It just has some characteristics of a bond in terms of its income yield or income return, 
but with growth attached to it, as or expected growth attached to it, um, which would make it a bit of an equity instrument as well. Now, if you look at that period from 2012 to 2016, where the black line sat between 0.6 and 1, there was a time where there was certainty on the income dynamic, and it was correlated highly to the bond yield. Going from 2016 to 2020, through the COVID dynamic and the issues arising before COVID for the sector, the sector traded very much more in terms of its OLZ dynamic or as an equity instrument, much less correlated to the bond. In fact, for some of the years, it wasn't paying a dividend, particularly in COVID. So without a dividend, it was very much viewed as an equity instrument and not a bond at all. Where we are today is with many of the stocks back at a dividend paying type of nature, um, the correlation is returning very much to the bond and equity. Over time, we expect it to trade more in line with the bond as certainty returns in terms of the income generation from the property sector. One discussion we often have with investors is around how they need to view property as a building block in their portfolio. Historically, it would always be viewed as a sector that would deliver 12 to 13 percent at least CAGR return per annum with a high element of capital um, and then the smaller component of income return and nowadays more income return and a smaller component of capital. But the volatility in the asset class has been extreme in recent years, rising in 2020 to as high as 96.8. Again, that is the depths of COVID where it took a massive knock as a sector. Barring which we want to see the sector return to becoming that 13% a year consistent return with low volatility. We are still starting to see that start to emerge, but we're probably a few months away and probably a few changes in interest rates away from the market starting to perceive it as such once again. If I'm to conclude, I would just really like to say the strategic returns are attractive. The company, the sector is back to paying a 10% type of dividend yield. The rental reversions are stable, vacancies are low, the operational improvement is there in many of the companies. What is hurting the outlook right now is obviously the refinancing of debt at higher levels, but the staggered nature of the, of the loan terms and the, and the hedging nature of that implies that they are seeing higher interest rates on their weighted average cost of debt. But if we can see interest rates start to decline in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll get back to the environment where it will become quite attractive and the, in, in the operational improvement that is evident in these companies will start to dominate the story. Right now, the story is very much around financing risk, not around the fact that they can't refinance. That's not the concern. The concern is at what rate they can refinance. And the numbers we're hearing is as high as 10%, but many companies are already there. So it doesn't look like there's going to be a material increase in cost of debt from current levels. The share prices are implying yields of more than 12%. The discount to NAV in which the sector trade is quite large right now. And on a medium term view, we would expect strategic total returns of around 15% uh, from the sector as definitely quite achievable. If I was to just chat through the subsectors very quickly, I won't dwell on them too much, but obviously, as I said, food, lower end retail can be very positive on that. Super regional, bigger shopping centers are starting to improve, even with weak discretionary spend. Um, diversified exposure to retail, office and industrial, we are negative on. But we do note that the valuations of some of these stocks have fallen to a level where maybe it does warrant a reinvestigation. Offices, will take years to still recover, we believe. So we are still negative on that space. Um, logistics, very positive. Companies continue to outsource and sign long-term leases with logistics players. And the storage companies and multi debt industrial stocks in the SA, UK and Germany continue to perform quite well. We are quite positive on that dynamic. <clears throat> so if I was to sum up, you know, I, I do believe SA is positioned for a very weak SA macro outlook. Let's not forget a significant amount of the property income is generated from offshore in the SA property sector. That is providing a hedge to what is a weak SA environment. Um, we are factoring in the, possible, the possibility that SA will continue to deliver 
below its potential growth in GDP on its current path. Um, we think that when the bond yields do come back and the sector normalizes, um, it will show very strong capital return dynamics. Um, the sector has, as I've said, gone through six years of challenges and has this has led to a lot of resilience being built into the companies. And the stock is very much really a REIT as a wrapper around a tax efficient structure. And the portfolios are really what matters. That is the essence of what a property company is. Those portfolios are now in a very defensive shape, having weathered the last six years off COVID, off concerns around LTV, off having too much office, off having a tail of assets, et cetera. Um, so we're very happy with where the positioning of the sector is going into what is hopefully a rate cut environment in some time in the medium term. The stuff we spoke about on the right are what we call the three R's. We believe the sector has restored its balance sheet. The income has been rebased. The tenant has been right-sized. Um, and the sector is well positioned for what is a weak SA macro outlook and potentially a stronger growth outlook in Western Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, and Central and Eastern Europe as well. The fundamentals are challenging but operational stabilization and improvement is evident. Retail and logistics have stabilized. Reversions are positive for good SA assets. Cost increases are always an issue. A lot of the ESCOM issues in terms of rising electricity are being offset to some extent with de-risking from solar investment and water harvesting. Corporate action continues in third quarter 2023. This is important for me because for many years, you didn't want to catch a falling knife, if I can use the phrase. You were concerned about buying into a sector where asset values were falling, where rental growth was negative, where balance sheets were constrained, and you were concerned about the medium term outlook. Property companies were unwilling to do deals where they themselves had that uncertainty at the back of their mind. Year to date, we've had uh, MLI, multi let industrial, get uh, acquired. We've had a tap to a deal with the government employee pension fund. We've had an offer being made for Liberty Two Degrees. So you can start to see property companies are comfortable enough with where they see valuations and the outlook for income growth that they are willing now to engage in sector consolidation, let's call it, or corporate action or merger and acquisition. And that's quite important because from the horse's mouth effectively, you are seeing comfort start to emerge. As I said, we're seeing an operational improvement, but higher funding costs are what's driving a downwards adjustment in distributable income per share. That's quite important because it's not because the companies are performing badly at an operational level. It's the finance cost dynamic that's impacting them now. The change in rates over time will help. And as I said, a lot of companies have already rebased to the higher interest rates um, that the current interest rates we experience would imply. Uh, we expect the retail, logistics, and inward listed property companies to outperform in 2024 with positive NOI growth. And on a one-year view, we would look for about 12% return from the sector, 10% being dividend yield, 2% being capital. And on a medium-term view, we would look for 12% income, 3% capital is potentially achievable. <clears throat> I'm just going to move on to the global side now. That sums up our views on the local. On the global side, there's been a change in terms of the way the sector is segmentally broken down. Years ago, it would have had a larger retail element. Today, retail is a smaller component. Logistics is bigger and residential is bigger. Those three sectors now make up about 50% of the global property index that you can access. Um, if you're looking at other sectors of note, data centers benefiting from AI, 8% of the global, global seg market, and self-storage as well, largely in the US, doing quite well there. Healthcare as a sector would be exposure to senior housing, medical office buildings, um, hospital facilities, and nursing care facilities, et cetera. Year to date, as of August 2023, and this picture hasn't changed too much in the last month and a bit. If you look at that picture on the left, total return by subsector, data centers have benefited from AI, the interest in NVIDIA, et cetera, 
the expected demand for more space by, by, by tenants in these centers. So they've done quite well. Office has performed quite poorly. Towers as well, long dated instruments have been negatively impacted by the bond yield, particularly companies like tower companies that have long dated leases. Um, and then you can see in the middle there, retail hasn't done so badly yet today, neither has residential. Um, but residential being a sector that we are quite positive on. Globally, if you look on the right though, year by year to date by country, there's a massive divergence, 37% divergence by country. The Nordic countries like Finland on the right have struggled with their housing dynamics. Countries like Spain, very strong GDP growth, um, a large tourist element coming through in that side, doing very well as is Netherlands. And the US, which is about 65 to 70% of the global property index or market as we look at it, um, very much flat as of August. But if I take that data as of the end of last month, it was probably down around five, six percent. But as you can see, you have to be very careful around your exposure by country, given their various dynamics driving some of these markets. I think one thing to, to, to be very clear about is a lot of these stocks have very defensive dynamics. As I said on the SA side, operationally good numbers, overshadowed by a refinance and, and, and funding environment that is not favorable to them. The same applies to the global companies. Um, we see a lot of companies that we like in Prologis, uh, Warehouse Depot, Tritex, Big Box and Industrial doing very well, benefiting from just in case inventories, more onshoring, more insular economies coming through, um, continued uh, supply chain efficiencies by their tenants or their tenants, tenants driving demand there. Again, we've seen results in the last few weeks where companies like Prologis have beaten on expectations and beaten on guidance, but yet the share prices fall on the back of concerns on the rising interest rate environment and the Fed fund rate. Net lease as well, um, triple net leases, high net margins, long dated leases, again, very defensive, um, again, exposed to what is a long duration of their leases. And with interest rates going up, they are struggling there as well. Uh, residential as a sector, you know, very confident and comfortable with that sector. Uh, we've seen a good few years of growth from those companies. As we enter a recession, we'll, we'll run through it now. We would expect some softening in that market, but nowhere near what was seen in the global financial crisis. And I'll run you through the, the thinking there as well, why, why we don't see that happening. Um, and then soft storage at the bottom there, again, you know, benefiting from people moving house. You can see in recent times, the volume of housing um, changing hands in the United States has slowed. So that has obviously had an impact on the self storage sector, as well as the fact that student debt costs have now risen quite materially in the US. There was a payment holiday um, in recent times, which could mean that students will now be cutting back on their storage space um, as one of the areas they can save some money in order to make their payments. <laughs> The one thing about the property sector is you see a lot of sensationalization on headlines. As you may have seen a day or two ago as well, there's a, there's a headline of potentially WeWork uh, going into liquidation. Um, I've seen that again, un, un, unverified, but being reported in the press. Um, the most shorted asset class in Europe and one of the most shorted in the US as of June 2023 was the property sector. Again, talking of uh, issues at malls, issues at offices, just really a negative dynamic coming through. Um, again, what, what I'd like to highlight is, yes, there are issues in office. Yes, there are issues in some malls. Yes, there are issues in some storage space, you could say, and German property prices have continued to fall. But by and large, the property sector is showing positive net operating income growth and continuing to perform well from an operational perspective, even in the face of what is quite a tough funding environment. Companies have pulled back on spending capex as things have gotten tougher. And as I'll show you soon, you know, in terms of loan to values, EV to EBITDA, um, interest coverage ratios, the sector is very, very conservatively positioned um, and with little risk of uh, 
the global financial crisis type of dynamics coming through. But like you, I often see these headlines all the time talking of what seems like an Armageddon on the horizon um, from property. Here we're looking just at the at the retail sector. We highlight the fact that uh, bankruptcies remain low uh, despite the tighter lending conditions. You can see on the right there hardly any retail bankruptcies in recent times have come through, even with a higher funding cost dynamic underpinning the, the markets and a slowing economy, you could say. And as we noted at the bottom there, Q1 leasing activity was 20% above historical averages, marking the 49th consecutive quarter of positive reversions on release renewals. That means when a lease came up for, for expiry, it was renewed at a rental above where it exited. This talks of the lessons learned in 2008, and this is quite important as well. I mean, in 2008, looking at the NAV discount, the sector fell to a 40% discount to NAV. Uh, it's currently as much as 26 on this slide. If I've dated for as of today, maybe 30, 35 is where the number is. EBITDA to EV, sitting one standard deviation below where it should be. Again, talking of how cheap the sector is sitting and historically very inexpensive on a 30 year view. If I look at the drawdown in US REITs since the global financial crisis, you can see that right now we're sitting at the second worst barring the global financial crisis. Um, we've noticed a very big difference between investment grade bonds and non-investment grade bonds in terms of what type of interest rate they can access. Um, 70 US REITs, 63% of the index have bond ratings, of which 85% are investment grade. That's very important. That means they're able to tap funding levels closer to the five, 6% levels. Whereas without investment grade ratings, you're tapping funding rates closer to the 10, 11% levels potentially. Um, NOI growth continues to be positive, and there's a large amount of private capital targeting real estate. We're seeing a lot of private big operators like BlackRock, et cetera, willing to take big portfolios out of the market, um, given they are perceiving a lot of value at these levels in these assets, and for those who are willing to take a medium-term view. <clears throat> this slide here talks of the net operating income growth expected from a lot of the stocks in the sector. You can see at the bottom there, this is the US, the weighted average growth, 5% in 2023, 4.5% in 24, and around similar levels in future years. No subsector in, re in the, the property market is expected to see negative growth. Having said that, office is as weak as 0.4, 0.6% in these two financial years. Um, again, highlighting it is a very difficult sector to operate in. It's a two-tier sector with some very good assets, with good tenants who don't want to vacate, and then a lot of assets which are obsolete and an oversupply condition emerging in those assets. So a tough sector to operate in, but you see very strong growth expected from industrial, which is logistics, uh, niche residential sectors like apartments, um, single family rentals, uh, manufactured homes. Talking to a story of operationally, good numbers coming out of a lot of these property companies. This slide shows you the US National Home Price Index over time, and the recessions are the gray bits. Now, what's interesting for me is, in the recessions, 99, the first two recessions on this graph, property prices didn't take a knock of any no, of any of any mention. The subprime mortgage issues that arose in 2007, 2008 negatively impacted the sector quite materially. Having come through that and entered a very low interest rate environment, the sector did very well in the preceding 10 odd years. What I'm trying to say here is a lot of us have a perception based on our recollection of the last recession that housing can take a massive bath in a recession. Yes, it can, but this time where we are positioned, we don't see a similar type of magnitude shock coming through in the housing sector. Lending criteria is a lot stricter. There is no subprime mortgage issue that led to massive 
uh, liquidations and, and cancellations in the, as happened in the previous sector. And going forward, we note that many of the outstanding mortgages are sitting around a 3.5% financing rate on the mortgage loan. The US is the only market in the world, I believe, where you can take a 30-year fixed mortgage. I believe from what I understand in the last 10 odd years, 70 to 80% of mortgages have been fixed at sub 4%. So where the count guys are sitting right now is if you have fixed a mortgage at those levels, you are unwilling to sell and move. Otherwise you'd be today trying to access a seven, 8% funding rate on a new mortgage. What this has meant is a lack of supply entering the US housing market, which has meant that the shortage of supply has driven up demand, which has meant that prices have continued to rise. And we've seen that in apartment rentals, multifamily rentals, um, single home rentals, which are also reflective of as, as the cost of mortgages go up, the cost of renting also rises as well. Also, what we believe is when rates do start declining, those buyers that have been sitting on the sideline waiting for a better rate environment to enter the property market will enter the US housing market as a, as a buyer of property. What all of this suggests to us is yes, property prices should soften from here, given the run that it's had in recent years, but we don't expect a correction or a recession of the magnitude that, would, that was evident in property prices in the global financial crisis. This slide is very interesting and talks to what I've said. If you look at the blue line on the left-hand side graph, the outstanding mortgage rate, you can see that is around three and a half percent on outstanding mortgages. You can see the policy rate, the way it has moved over time, rising to as much as five odd percent now. And you can see the new mortgage rate has risen in, since 2022 from where you could access a mortgage at 3%, today you will all access that same mortgage at 7%. What that has meant for a mortgage, by, if you look at it by city, is what in June 2019 in New York would have cost you $1,800 as an average cost of a US mortgage, to, and they will now cost you almost $4,000 in New York City. That increase has meant a lot of potential buyers have had to sit out the market, leading to a shortage of supply, which over time should result in, if prices were to fall, not a material fall happening. If you're looking at the sector on a PE basis, or as we call it, a price to FFO basis, it is sitting at a similar level to where it was sitting at, let's say, its lowest point in recent years. It's only touched this level once in 2018, once in 2014, and then dropped below it, obviously, in 08, 09, where the global financial crisis had a material impact on it. If you look on the right-hand side there, the reversion to the 15-year norm of some of these subsectors, the all, all REIT sector in the US should rise 16% if it was to revert to its long term norm. Office storage residential, some of the cheaper sectors should rise between 100% to 50%. Having said that, obviously, office does have increasing structural issues facing it. Um, but some of these other sectors you could say have been oversold. Healthcare is a sector there at the bottom, is the only sector that is actually traded above its long-term average and could potentially revert down 6% to its long-term. We believe very strongly that the US REIT should trade at a higher multiple in 2023 than in 2008, given structural improvements in company quality. Uh, we think a lot of the bad news is already in a lot of these prices. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the global financial crisis type multiples we, we believe the sector should correct downwards, the residential, given affordability is becoming more of an issue at these house prices and these rentals, but it's unlikely to correct to the level that you saw at the global financial crisis. This just highlights the price to book of the sector. You can see it's trading here at about a almost 20% discount to the sector. If I was to update it as of today, this is as of May, 2023. Um, again, suggesting there's a significant upside if there's a rebound. Looking at the sector over the long term, the average annual return is about 10.5% in US dollars over 30 years. Only in three years 
has the drawdown been greater than 10% in the sector, that being in 07, 08, and 2022. In the other years, that would be an outlier. If you're looking at it on a czar basis, the sector has delivered 16% CAGR return over 30 years. Again, only three instances where it's delivered worse than greater than minus 10%. Similar type of years, 08, this time 02, and 2022. <clears throat> this slide is very important to understand the historical context. In 2008, debt to asset value was as high as 55% as a ratio. Today, we are sitting at more like 27%. Historical average is 35 and a half. Lending criteria is stronger, uh, sorry, I mean stricter. Companies have taken advantage of a multi-year low interest rate environment to stagger and ladder their debt profile at low interest rates. Yes, they are having to refi at high interest rates now, but they pushed out the term maturity of a lot of that debt to a point where if we can start seeing rates decline in the next 24 months, there won't be any issues of material concern arising in the sector. And if you look at the right hand side at the payout ratio here, if you look at 2008, um, the sector was paying out about 85% of its income as dividends. Now it's as low as 67%. Again, retained earnings being utilized to fund developments and provide a buffer and show up the balance sheet and pay down debt. This slide is quite important, looking at how the REIT sector performs before and after a rate hiking cycle. If you look on the right hand side, after the Fed funds rate has changed, in the three months, six months, and 12 month period, property tends to perform quite well. Um, obviously, in the rate hiking cycle itself, property tends to struggle to some extent, as we have seen. Um, but as we start exiting that, the opportunity arises to see good returns from the US REITs as a sector. This is a slide from CBRE looking at total return expectations by property subsectors over the next few years, let's say the next five years, 2023 to 2028. Um, if you look on the right hand side, logistics, modern logistics is expected to deliver an almost 13% total return. 9.9% from single family rental, residentials, apartments to deliver 9%, self storage to deliver 9%. You'll see on the far left here, legacy office, obsolete office will struggle very much, we believe. Um, malls will still be positive, 4.4%. But very clearly, you can see most asset classes are expected to show positive returns on a multi-year view. If I were to sum up the global properties view, economic growth expected to decelerate in 2023, inflation, above average for 2023, but falling, that's starting to manifest. Monetary policy, we expect tight conditions to prevail through 2023. Um, people took a lot of positivity from the Fed's comments yesterday, as we can see in market, probably looking to the outlook for next year. Um, again, if I look at the structural growth potential for the sector, um, we, we could definitely see that the cost of funding will decline as interest rates start to decline over time. FinTech is definitely coming through more and more, using solar, et cetera, to improve the profit margins of these companies more and more. <clears throat> and if I was to give you the near-term rental growth prospects we expect from the sector, even in an economic downturn and whatever the recession looks like when it potentially happens, um, we still expect niche residential, industrial or logistics, as we call it, data centers and tower REITs to perform quite well as asset classes. Again, just to make the point, a lot of these subsectors we talk of are long duration leases, in some extent mimicking the long dated US Treasury. So as that comes down, there's an amplified effect in the way these sectors will tend to perform. I'm going to pause there for any questions, if I may, Simon. I mean, that was absolutely brilliant. I love your presentations. You, you, I'm a data nerd and you bring data to the party. Max, if you've got a 
if you've got a question, drop it in the q and A. I've got a few that came through already. The, the first question, and this is a bit of how long is a piece of string, but what sort of percentage should possibly be in a diverse portfolio? I was always told sort of around about the 10 to 15 percent. Yeah, I mean, I've heard the numbers as high as as, as 20 percent. Um, I know everyone is very much underweight property still, but they are looking at it as an asset class. Yeah. I think what's changed is it's weighting in the index has declined a lot in mm. the last few years, given the share price performance. I mean, when I think of it historically, you know, I remember Nepi has a 200 rand share in 2017. It's now 100 bucks. Yeah. Growth, for growth board was almost 30 bucks a share. It's now nine bucks. You can see what what's happened to the share prices of a lot of these companies. Look, I would say once, and I've said this in the presentation, once the property sector starts delivering the building block nature that it has historically, and it'll take a year for investors to see that or two years for their track record to be to say, okay, property is now back to being what it was. It's delivering the 13% I expect a year. I can now put it at 10 to 15% in my portfolio. Until then, I think guys will sit on the sidelines and wait, and I can fully understand um, why uh, investment professionals would do that. Yeah, look, I'm in property right now because as you point out, I'm not getting price appreciation, but I'm getting yield and I'm happy with either. Corne is asking if there's any local uh, REITs that give data center exposure. I don't think there is, or, am I in, or are there? You know, that's a very good question. Unfortunately, right now, not. Um, we, we know one or two property companies are thinking of going down that road and maybe doing a data center or two. But from looking at data centers globally, you know, there's a few things that need to happen. Um, you know, when you pull a YouTube video in SA, it doesn't go to California. If it's a frequently viewed video here, it's pulled from Terraco, which is those on your way to the airport. Um, it's those very big data centers. Um, you'll see them on the right hand side on your way to the Oatambo airport. Um, you need a lot of electricity for data center to work. You need generators, you need backed up power, you need HVAC systems, massive air conditioning, you need big diesel tanks. The fit out of the building itself is more than the value of the building. So it's a massive undertaking to go down the center of building a data center. In South Africa, I think the assets are still too young to fit into a mature REIT model. Mm -hmm. There have been discussions around maybe one or two coming to market. But I think it's still very early days for, for and also with our ESCOM issues, um, I can just imagine a data center list and people will think ESCOM load shedding and I don't know if it'll achieve the valuation people think. Yeah, no, I take your point on that. Another question coming through around uh, uh, sectors, um, two that we're missing in South Africa and there's been a fair bit of talk that, that they would come is, is a health REIT and a student housing REIT. Any, any update on that? I think growth point had one of them and was going to spin it out. I'm not sure what's happening there. Yeah, I think Growth Point's still doing their healthcare REIT internally. There are thoughts of potentially spinning it out. Um, you know, in SA, we've got Life Healthcare, MediClinic, and Edcare. I know they're not REITs, but um, in some ex to some extent, they are in terms of the underlying assets and what they do. Um, so, I mean, it's something that's been spoken of. There is actually a company that just listed in South Africa on the JSC, a UK company called Primary Health Property, PHP yes. is the ticker. Um, it's a UK uh, healthcare company uh, backed by NHI leases, 7% um, yield in, in sterling and uh, reasonable growth. So yeah, we can actually access it, but not through SA assets, but through UK property. It's actually a phenomenal company worth looking at, I suppose. Yeah, I, I've actually, yeah, it, it came on, was it just last week? I think it listed PHP. I, I, I spotted just last week. Yeah, and I've actually got them. I've asked them if they can uh, come come on the the, the, the show. Uh, a, a, a last question, um, maybe there's some more coming, but it, for now, the different sectors obviously are, uh, in, and if you look broadly at South Africa, which is going to be your, sort of your office, your retail, and then your commercial slash, slash industrial slash logistic. As a as a as a as an investor into the REIT space, I mean, should I overly stress the oh they've got too much office, or do we understand that you know what bits of it are going to be lumpy, bits of it are going to operate at, at, at different times, and you almost get the, the contrasting returns. In other words, don't shy away and say office is terrible, let's abandon it. Do we take a bit of everything and 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 sort of you know the good with the bad in a sense? 
Well, I mean, there's three property companies in SA that expose you to SA office. That is Burstone, which was the old Investec property fund. Um, there's Growth Point and Redefine. Now, Redefine's done very well on its office space. Growth Point's office space, I think, is near 28 billion rand of assets. It's a lot. Um, and then Investec's doing okay. So you're right. I mean, don't you can't just lump it in an asset class. Some assets in office do quite well. Um, some, unfortunately, do quite poorly still. Folks, we will leave that there. I'm not seeing any more questions coming through to everyone who came to the webcast. I appreciate, as I always say, you could have had lots of things you could have done with your Thursday evening. You came and uh, uh, elected to to get smarter about REITs. Amit Motara, Stanlip, always appreciate the insights. Jen, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Simon. Bye. Cheers, all.